I don't know any adult over the age 30 who hasn't heard of Bernie Madoff. Bernie Madoff was convicted in June of 2009 and sentenced to 150 years in prison, the maximum allowed, for what is now the largest Ponzi scheme ever. He pled guilty to 11 felony counts, which included securities fraud, investment advisor fraud, money laundering, false statements, perjury, making false claims with the Securities and Exchange Commission, committing theft of an employee benefit plan. Prosecutors claimed that over $170 billion moved through the principal Madoff account over several decades, beginning in the 1970s. And before his arrest, the firm's statements showed a total of $65 billion in accounts. He died this past week at age 82 in prison. Now here's some information you might find interesting. Bernie Madoff you earned about $5,000 from a summer lifeguarding job and a side gig of installing sprinkler systems to start Bernard L. Madoff Investment Securities, LLC. His firm became famous for annual returns of 10% or more, and by the 1980s, his firm handled up to 5% of all the trading done on the New York Stock Exchange. According to... Um, to Time Magazine, December 7th, 2010, Madoff never turned a profit on the money he was given, nor did he invest any of it. Among the people who lost tons of money, thanks to Bernie Madoff, were Larry King, actor Kevin Bacon, and Kira Segwick, uh, Steven Spielberg, Jeffrey Katzenberg, Nobel Peace Prize recipient and Holocaust survivor L.A. Weissel, and a number of billionaires who should have known better. Well, let me ask you, would you consider Bernie Madoff generous? Well, most likely not. But the truth is, he served on a, a number of boards. He was a prominent philanthropist. He served on many non-profit institutions boards, several of which entrusted his firm with their endowments. He donated about $6 million to the lymphoma, lymphoma research when his son was diagnosed with the disease. He was involved with the Gift of Life Bone Marrow Foundation and made a philanthropic uh, gifts through Madoff Family Foundation, a $19 million private foundation he and his wife managed. On December 10th, 2008, Bernie Madoff told his sons he wanted to pay out $178 million in bonuses several months before they were normally paid out. And when his sons challenged the idea, he insisted they move to his apartment to continue the conversation. And there he confessed the scam. The following morning, December 11th, the FBI knocked on Bernie Madoff's door and asked him if there was an innocent explanation for it all, and Bernie Madoff replied, no, it's all been one big lie. When you take the money that doesn't belong to you and use it for yourself and give some to other people, that's not called generosity, it's called robbery. Bernie Madoff took money that didn't belong to him and indulged himself, his family, and his friends, and then attempted to keep the scheme going by continually giving other people's money to other people. On the day when he was sentenced for his crimes, he apologized to his victims, and he said, I have left a legacy of shame. Bernie Madoff will forever be remembered as one of the biggest financial frauds in human history. Sadly, his one of his own sons committed suicide on the second anniversary of his father's arrest. We are in a sermon series on the power of generosity. No, not the Bernie Madoff kind, which is life-destroying. The more he misused what wasn't his, even when he was giving it away to good people and good causes, it got him in more and more trouble. But he lost everything he had, and he died in prison. So we're not talking about the life-destroying Bernie Madoff kind of generosity, which is really robbery, taking what's not yours and misusing and abusing it. We're talking about the God kind of generosity, which is life-giving and life-changing. Something happens, something powerful happens when people are generous like God wants us to be.
Now, we've already seen that generosity comes from God. God initiates it and wants us to imitate it. He wants us to be generous like he is to imitate him. Remember, his goal for our lives, besides taking us to heaven, is in the meantime, not necessarily our comfort, but our character development. He wants us to become more Christ-like the older we are as believers, the more mature we are as Christians. And reproducing, imitating his generosity is part of that, is one of those traits, is part of that process. And God has a plan and a purpose behind us being generous. He's been incredibly generous with us, and he's given us, as Paul wrote to Timothy, everything we need that pertains to life and godliness, and he's given us all things richly to enjoy. In 1 Timothy 6, 17. The earth we live on, heaven, where we're going, our ultimate home, our bodies, our families, and endless resources of this world, and the endless opportunities we have to do almost anything we want, they're all gifts, generous gifts from God. James chapter 1, verse 17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above. So first, generosity comes from God. But secondly, Today, we're going to look at how generosity continues in us. It continues in us. Now, how can generosity, the generosity of God, continue in us? Well, a key passage for all of Jesus' followers is 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20. We talked about it a little bit last Sunday, where Paul wrote, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So God appeals to the lost world through his people, through you and me. The high calling of Jesus was to seek and to save the lost. And so the primary responsibility and mission of the church, of you and I as part of Jesus' church, is the mission, the ministry of reconciliation. That's the primary thrust of of the church in our lives. So we are God's ambassadors. We are his representatives in this world. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 1 and 2 says, This then is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ, and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Now it's required, Paul says, that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. Now the word entrusted is interesting. Paul uses a word here that originally referred to a person entrusted with and responsible for everything in his master's household. Buildings, fields, food, finances, even the master's family. So you and I are personal ambassadors, representatives, and stewards, managers of everything God entrusts to us. And we are to be faithful and trustworthy with everything he gives us. And he gives us a lot. He trusts us to be faithful. So the question is, of course, are we? But I think many people today um, are kind of like Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, back in the Old Testament book of 2 Kings. Gehazi served Elisha just as Elisha had served his mentor, Elijah. You remember the story of Naaman, the leper? How Elisha sent word to him to go and dip himself seven times in the Jordan River, he'd be healed of his leprosy. That's recorded for us in 2 Kings 5, verses 1 to 14. Well, here's the rest of the story. Naaman came back to Elisha and thanked him and to give him some gifts of appreciation for his healing him. Elisha turned down the gifts from Naaman. After they parted ways, Gehazi, Elisha's servant, went back to negotiate uh, something for himself. 2 Kings 5, verses 15 to 19. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel, so please accept a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. 
And even though Naaman urged him, um, Elisha refused. Verse 17. If you will not, said Naaman, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other god but the Lord. But may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing, when my master enters the temple of Rimmon to bow down and is leaning on my arm, and I have to bow there also. When I bow down in the temple of Rimmon, may the Lord forgive your servant of this. Go in peace, Elisha said. And so after Naaman had traveled some distance, then Gehazi returned. And Gehazi was guilty of greed and lying. When he got back home, after he went back to um, try to entice some gifts out of Naaman, Elisha confronted him in 2 Kings 5, verses 25 to 27. When he went in and stood before his master, Elisha asked him, Where have you been, Gehazi? Your servant didn't go anywhere, Gehazi answered. But Elisha knew better, and he answered him, Was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to take money or accept get clothes or olive groves or vineyards or flocks or herds or male or female slaves? Naaman's leprosy, Elisha said, will cling to you and to your descendants forever. And then Gehazi went from Elisha's presence and his skin was leprous. It had become as white as snow. So don't miss this. Gehazi went to try to bargain something out of Naaman and he wound up getting something from Naaman he never wanted, leprosy, for the rest of his life. You see, when we take what isn't ours and try to use it to enhance our own lives or the lives of others, we disconnect ourselves from the power source of our lives. Remember, we are representatives of God. We are his ambassadors, his stewards. Romans 14, verse 7 and 8 says, for none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. So not just what we have, but who we are. Everything comes from Him. It belongs to Him. And is to be used to glorify Him. Mismanaging what God has given us as his children, as believers, usually takes one of two different turns. One is we turn away from what God has told us to do. Or we turn to debt to get what God has not given us yet. We turn away from what God tells us we're to do, and we turn to debt to get what God hasn't given us yet. Now, I think we often confuse generosity with our responsibility. In the book of Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament, chapter 3, verse 8 and 9 says, Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse, the whole nation, because you're robbing me. Like Bernie Madoff, these Israelites were claiming to be generous, but used what rightfully belonged to someone else for themselves and for their own purposes. Malachi chapter 1, verses 6 to 14 tells us that they were bringing animals for sacrifice, but it didn't involve much of a sacrifice on their part. Why? Because they brought the lame and the diseased animals to God, kept the best for themselves. But sacrificing to God was not a means of culling out the weak and sick of their herds. They were to give their first and best. You see, what Gehazi did, for example, was disgusting trying to play on Naaman's emotions to, for personal gain. What Bernie Madoff did was absolutely despicable and criminal. What should we call it when people keep the best for themselves as God's people and give God the leftovers? Or when people keep it all for themselves and give God nothing? Now, God didn't call that generosity. He calls it robbery. Again, Malachi 3, verses 8 and 9. Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, 
How are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings, you're under a curse, the whole nation, because you're robbing me. Once in a sermon one Sunday, Pastor John Hagee said, Some of you drove to church today in stolen cars. Some of you sitting here today in the service are wearing stolen clothes. Some of you live in houses that you built with stolen money. You ask how? Well, you took God's tithe and you used it for yourself. See, we have a responsibility, a biblical responsibility to return to God what's rightfully His. And the Bible says the minimum, <coughs> the starting point, is the tithe or the giving a 10% of whatever God has blessed us with. At least it was in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, before Christ came to seek and save the lost and ransom and redeem us from our sins and to give us salvation. In Matthew 23, verse 23, Jesus said, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you've neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without, without neglecting the former. You see, tithing is not generosity. Not really. It's a biblical responsibility. Now, I know some people are going to say, well, you know, that was an Old Testament command. That's not commanded in the New Testament. Or they'll say, well, I tithe my time or I, I, I tithe in other ways. Well, we should all do that anyway. Whether you're retired, a senior citizen, or a teenager, it doesn't matter. But since we have salvation by grace through our faith in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ in our place on the cross for our sins, then don't you think the tithe ought to be the beginning point for us under the new covenant? Way back in Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30, the Bible says a tithe of everything belongs to the Lord. So again, that command was given under the old covenant before Christ died to purchase our salvation. And we don't live under the law. We don't live having the sacrificial system hanging over our heads and all the law to obey. We have two commandments to obey, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves. We are free in Christ by God's grace to be all that God's called us to be. And I think that just starts with the tithe. So let me repeat, mismanaging what God gives us usually takes one of two turns. We turn away from what God says we're to do. Not tithing, not giving to God what's rightfully his. And then secondly, we turn to God, uh, we turn to debt to get what God has not yet given us. In this case, we can't be generous because we've taken on additional debt responsibilities. We've maxed out the credit cards. Uh, we've borrowed money and struggled to pay it back. We put ourselves in a difficult position. And, of course, <clears throat> our giving to God's kingdom usually is the first thing that we leave out. Someone aptly, <clears throat> aptly equipped the acronym DEBT, D-E-B-T, stands for don't even buy that. Someone else said, well, debt really means dumb expl explanations for buying things. The truth is debt doesn't bring us freedom. It brings, bo uh, bo brings bondage to us. Proverbs 22, verse 7 says, The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is a lender, the slave of the lender. <clears throat> like a guy dragging around a huge ball and chain fastened to his leg. <clears throat> debt goes with you wherever you go, to work, at home, when you eat, when you sleep. When you watch TV, no matter where you go, debt goes with you. And if you try to help someone else with their debt, it weighs you down, slows you down, and it still follows you wherever you go. <coughs> now, of course, the key to getting free from debt is found in the Word of God. Proverbs 6, beginning with verse 1, reads, My son, if you put your up security for your neighbor, like co-signing, if you've shaken hands and pledged for a stranger, if you have tr been trapped by what you said and snared by the words of your mouth, 
of your mouth. Do this, my son, to free yourself, since you have fallen into your neighbor's hands. Go to the point of exhaustion and give your neighbor no rest. Allow no sleep to your eyes, no slumber to your eyelids. Free yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the snare of the fowler. If you're in debt or co-signed for someone else's debt, get out as quickly as possible. <clears throat> Take some incredibly good advice. Don't follow the example of Bernie Madoff or Gehazi. Instead, follow God's example and be generous. Generosity comes from God and he wants it to continue in us. Now, please hear once again the words of 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20, where Paul says, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us, because he is. We implore you, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God wants us, every single one of us, to use what he has given us to help other people come to know him and his son, Jesus. That's the best and the most important, the most essential use of your money is to give to kingdom needs, uh, ministry needs that help expand God's kingdom and help reach lost people. Nothing's a greater priority in all of life. God can make his appeal to a lost and dying world through you. Can he? Or are you living a life that wouldn't appeal to anyone in view of eternity? Is Jesus at the core, the hub of your being, where all the elements of your life, all the spokes on the wheel revolve around him as the hub, the Lord, the master, the center, the core of your existence? When you reach, begin to reach that point, you're beginning to mature and to be more like Jesus, allowing him to control every segment of your life. And it absolutely uh, has a lot to do with our finances. In fact, Jesus spoke more about money in, par in parables than any other subject. You see, when you and I live generously and give generously, God can use us to touch the world. Living and giving generously enables us to invest in the spiritual future, the eternal future of more and more people, people who will spend eternity in either heaven or hell. And in the end, that's all that matters. Everything else we'll leave behind. Now, there's a powerful lesson to learn from the account Jesus related as recorded by Dr. Luke in Luke chapter 16. Verses 19 to 31. I want you to follow along in your Bibles, if you could, as I read from Luke 16, verses 19 to the rest of the chapter. There was a rich man, Jesus said, who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate he laid a beggar named Lazarus, who was covered with sores. And longing to eat what fell on the rich man's table, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me, and send Lazarus dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I'm in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while well, Lazarus received bad things. Now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family. For I have five brothers, let him warn them so they will not also come to this place of torment. And Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets, let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, if, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they'll repent. And he said to him, If they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they'll not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. 
Now, there's two or three takeaways from this this account of Luke 16, 19 to 31. A couple of comments and then one major takeaway. First comment is there are some who say this is not really a parable. It was just maybe per perhaps an actual event that Jesus related because it's different in the way it begins than most parables. But also, Jesus names the people involved, and he doesn't do that in any other parable. So they say it's not a parable. But I believe that it was a parable, mostly because of the context. Now remember, there was no chapter and verse divisions when Scripture was recorded originally by the original authors. And so if you read the first part of the 16th chapter, which we're going to be studying this next Sunday on the 25th of April in our sermon, the thrust of that is that it is a parable. And so I believe that Luke 16, 19, and 31 is a companion uh, com a parable that Jesus taught. Now, a second comment. There are some... Uh, References made to different aspects of life after death, existence after death, in this a parable that Jesus told about rich man, the rich man of Lazarus. And I'm sure those things can bolster up other teachings in the New Testament about what happens after we die, and about Hades and it being the abode of all dead, having two compartments, torments, um, where there is punishment much like hell, or maybe a prelude to hell, but the same kind of experience. And then there's also an abode in in Hades, the abode of the dead. There's a section that's separated called paradise. And that Abraham was in paradise with 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 Lazarus, the beggar who died. Well there may be some parallels between those teachings in Luke 16, 19-31 about the afterlife with other teachings in New Testaments, but I don't think that was the primary thrust of this passage to tell us about the afterlife per se. I think, regardless, the major takeaway is all in all of this in Luke 16, 19-31 is this, this account is much more about the living than it is the dead. Jesus, in the context, had been speaking to the Pharisees who loved wealth more than they loved the prophets, and this teaching was designed then to show them, first, the eternal consequences of the present use of wealth. Luke 16, 19-31 was taught primarily by Jesus. Number one, foremost, overriding purpose of this passage was to teach people about the eternal consequences of the present use of wealth. Because the rich man in this account, in this parable, was apparently never concerned about anybody but himself when he lived. But suddenly, for the first time in his existence, in torment, in, in Hades, suffering there, he was concerned about the eternal destiny of other people. And he desperately wanted to get warning to them not to come to where he was at, to avoid the agony and torment he was experiencing. Because of the way he had lived, he now had no chance, no opportunity to give generously in ways that would benefit others spiritually or eternally. All he knew was he wanted to spare other people the same fate that he was experiencing and suffering. And that should speak volumes to us. It really should. In the 1980 movie, The Blues Brothers, which was based on the recurring musical sketch from Saturday Night Live at that time. It was the story of a paroled convict named Jake and his brother Elwood who teamed up together to try to save the Catholic orphanage they grew up in. You probably remember that movie. But it starred John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd and even had Carrie Fisher in it, who played Princess Leia in the movie Star Wars. But The Blues Brothers is a funny movie with a number of uh, hilarious moments in it. But the main focus of the movie is that Jake and Elwood are on a mission from God. Remember that line? We're on a mission from God to save the orphanage. And eventually they do. Oh, my friends, please hear me. Please hear me. You and I are on a mission from God. 
not necessarily to save an orphanage, but to reach every man, woman, boy, and girl we can with the gospel of Jesus Christ. God's counting on us. This was Jesus' high calling who was here on earth, and he's given that to every single Christian in every single church. It's primary, it's supreme to anything else the church does. Everything else in the church is secondary to this overriding primary purpose. William James said it like this, the greatest use of life is to spend it on something that will outlast it. Boy, that's true of our finances and our time and our ta talents. By being generous, not only can we stay on the mission, we can accomplish it as well. God is a source of generosity. He initiates it. We are to imitate it as we imitate him. He expects all of us who follow Jesus to do the same. We're to live our lives, every segment of our lives, with the end of life here and with our eternal life to come in mind. Are you? What actions do you need to take today? What is your next step to take on your journey towards Christ-likeness, God's goal for your life as a follower of Jesus Christ? Only you can answer that. Only you know where you're at spiritually. But I plead with you, to consider right now your generosity. Generosity begins with God. He initiates it. We're to imitate it. God's generosity is to continue in us.